we're, we'll get started. I'll call the meeting to order. We are, thank you all for joining us tonight for this special meeting, which is the, a virtual roundtable discussion of the Racial Equity and Justice Task Force. My name is Gina Ludlow. I am the one of the co-chairs of the task force. This is Karen Lynch. She's also a task force member. Uh, we have a few task force members on the call. Uh, I see Doug Bunnell, Annie Dingra, Sandra Tallman. Um, who else is here? Jason Sherrod. Jason uh, and then lots of, of people that we've known for a long time. So first off, we want to start by thanking you very much for joining us. Um, hopefully we're going to spend the next 90 minutes updating you on the work that we've been doing as a task force, getting to know you a little bit, your Fairfield experience a little bit, and then giving you sort of a sneak peek at how we have arrived where we are with our current blueprint. And hopefully our goal for the evening tonight is to continue to, um, to develop our, our blueprint and to add in these your very important stories and your very important input. So do we ever make a motion to open the meeting? No, we don't. No, I okay. think we just opened it. So um, we do have our first order of business on the agenda, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. Let me just make sure um, Petrinia is unmuted. Where is she? Look at this great list of people. I just, Petrinia, I just sent you a request to unmute. Um, so you may want to pull that up and, um, uh, you know, unmute yourself because what we're doing is we have invited, um, one of our kind of, what's it, what? Oh yeah. Which reminds me, I really, before we get started, I really need to thank Karen, Matt Danzer, um, Betsy McNeil and Katrina Cash who worked together diligently on doing this meeting, which seems very simple, but had multiple, <laughs> multiple, multiple emails to pull off. So I want to thank them because they are people who show up at the task force meetings every week. Um, some of our faithfuls like Ryan Odenak, who's on the call tonight as well. Um, and we really can't, couldn't do what we do without the people in the community sure. who, who come out. So just so y'all know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the little um, hands. So uh, anyway, it's, <laughs> Fun technology, but I am seeing the little the little class. So um, Petrinia is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and because we figured people don't necessarily have a flag in their kind of space at home, I'm actually going to share what Gina and I have put together so that everybody has the ability to, you know, to look at a flag. So can you all see my screen? Gina and I might have gone away, but hopefully you're seeing our screen. So Petrinia, hopefully you've um, been able to get unmuted. Let me try again. If you did not, I just requested that you unmute. Tell us when you're live. Hello. Okay, I'm here. Hi, that's great. If if um, if you would um, go ahead and get us started, it's it's great to have your participation. Good evening. May we all please stand and place our right hand over our heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. How appropriate we stand here this evening to recite an allegiance that ends in liberty and justice for all. And we are uniting together for equity and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Petrina. Thank you so much. So we're gonna get right into it. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, the, the Racial Equity and Justice Task Force was, um, we were put together by first select woman, uh, Brenda Kupchik in October of this year. And uh, she recommended that we form an advisory committee. And our purpose is to study and advise the board of selectmen on existing town policies and procedures in an effort to enhance and improve Fairfield's commitment 
to systemically fair and equal treatment of all town residents, businesses, workers, and visitors, regardless of race. And so we've been working together for the past however many months that is. Nine. Nine months um, <laughs> and have birthed this baby. Um, I'm the wrong way, sorry. Yeah, whoops, slow down. Where did I go? It's just super sensitive. I'll do it, I'll, I'll go back. So the scope of our work uh, as the task force is, and our mission is that we're gonna collect qualitative and quantitative data. So that's both the stories of our constituents and some numerical data. We're gonna use, we are using active listening. We're convening conversations to, and identifying best practices and collaborating with existing organizations to formulate their racial equity plan for the town of Fairfield. So uh, a big part of our work is talking to the residents of Fairfield to really help us create this vision for an equitable fair Fairfield. So the, the key to our success is our database decision-making. And that is really looking at some of those, um, the existing data in town, somebody's on mute. Um, community engagement, which is what we're doing tonight. Um, advocacy and continuous learning, and also reviewing our policies, procedures, ordinances, and charter view. That's been a big piece of what we did in our work. So we were really tasked to look at current and existing practices and to see if there's any way that we could improve what in many ways is working really well and in some is not working not quite so well. So in our mission statement, we are, as part of our mandate, we are really exploring the existing policies to see where there might be implicit or explicit biases, which contribute to racial inequity in all aspects of Fairfield governance with the goal of providing formal recommendations. So essentially uh, the first select woman wanted us to look in to see, are there things that are, where can we improve? Where are the, are the biases that, you know, some of them, when we think about explicit bias, they're things that we know um, that we sort of actively know are biased, but implicit bias are things that just exist without us thinking. And there are things that have been in, embedded into the town because of context and time and, and when these rules were made that in 2021 don't make as much sense as they did when they were put together in 1930, 1920, when Fairfield was a very, very differently composed town. And our goal is to put together our equity blueprint that we're gonna present to the Board of Selectmen when we're done with it, which is what we're gonna be working on tonight. And all of this information that Gina just shared with you, for those of you who are kind of new to um, getting together with us and talking about this work, it's all on the town website. Our entire mission is on there um, with our scope and with you know the information in each of the buckets Gina just outlined, including this one. So that's all there. It's public information, as are all of our agendas and all of our minutes from previous meetings. So it, with that kind of as historical context, and again, you know, I have the chat open here. So if you start to have questions about any of this, feel free to use the chat. I know everyone's muted, but that's just because um, we're kind of- uh, There's a lot of us here. Yeah, there's a lot of us here and we're, we're keeping that under wraps, but we wanna make sure that we can unmute you if you have, you know, sort of a question or respond to your question via text for sure. So to date, once we, once we were all initiated, for instance, or um, not initiated, what did we call that? Sworn Inducted, in. sworn in, in October, we started our phone calls and um, started to, to divvy up some work and people volunteered to do certain things. And then we assigned certain things to individuals who were interested in that space. So for instance, we had a few people who were looking into existing survey data. Some of the organizations in town had already done some of that work, whether it was Fairfield Cares, the education system, uh, some of the equity groups. So we had some existing survey research already. Uh, they re it reviewed secondary data. This is just information that's public, publicly um, known in the state of Connecticut uh, that we were able to access some public information, including demographics, for instance. So we reviewed that data. There were people st who started to review our town charter uh, and some of the historical documents and talking to the folks at the Fairfield, um, Fairfield you know, History Museum and getting a feel for that. We also conducted deep listening interviews where members of the task force interviewed people in key areas of, of town, for instance, whether it was governance or 
um, history or education or um, housing, mm -hmm. policing, law enforcement, um, uh, HR. HR. So we, we had these deep listening conversations with who, leaders in those areas and also with individuals who were a little bit kind of lower down on that um, on that kind of hierarchy in those different departments so that we could really start to get a feel for what they've seen, what um, what they've uh, experienced, what they have heard in the context of the space where they operate, and what they where they felt the need lie. Yeah, needs yeah. lie. Yeah, and then we had some speakers attend our meetings. We had a um, and a new, one of the individuals, um, Lanesia from the Fairfield Equity Coalition. Uh, she came and presented some of the stuff that the, the youth groups have been working on. And uh, so the Fairfield Equity Coalition is a group in town of young adults and current students who are really looking in a very in-depth way. I, I think it, it started last summer with a number of alumni who really wanted to look more deeply at the education they, really, they received in the town of Fairfield. And so they sent out a survey to I think 400 students to get their feelings about what they felt about their education. And they've been working to make recommendations to the board of education uh, based upon the, their experiences as students. And they are now working with the current students as well to really um, to revisit how they see their education in Fairfield, um, you know, could be better bolstered they got out into the world and realized that, that there were things that they felt like they did not experience here that would have made their experience better. So they're really advocating with the current um, school board for making changes within the schools. Yeah. And then uh, another guest speaker that we had was um, Ken Barone, who's, I'm getting his title right by reading it, Project Manager of Connecticut Racial Profiling Prohibition Project, CTRP3. Um, and he was working on behalf of the Institute for Municipal and Regional Policy at the Central Connecticut State University. Um, fascinating data on um, policing in not just Connecticut, but also in Fairfield and some of the disparities in stops, for instance. They specifically look at racial profiling stops all over the state. They look at all 173 municipalities. And every year they look at um, they sort of pull out specific towns to for areas to address and i think their 2016 or 17 report i'm not sure which one focused specifically on on racial profiling stops in fairfield and so they collected tremendous amounts of data about uh, stops in town and about racial profiling and stops in town and then presented that to the police station yeah we have a question um what is the percentage of teachers of color in Fairfield over the last 20 to 25 years. I would say not many. Yeah. John uh, Whaley might, uh, John yeah. Whaley is on the call. John, I don't know if you, if you know that the percent of teachers of color in Fairfield, um, John Whaley is at Fairfield ward and he's, um, doing great work there and, um, may, may have that information. If not Amy, you know, that could be really interesting for us to find out, but yeah. Not, yeah. That's and, a great question. And we'll definitely, you know, look into that. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so yeah, so that so some of those guest speakers, and I'll get you something. See, John Whaley's going to be on the job. Um, thank you, John. So let's see. So we had these meet people. Uh, we also had people from other task force or other committees, standing committees, the Sustainable Fairfield. Um, that committee came in, and the Strategic, Strategic Planning Committee. They came in to speak to us. Um, we started researching best practices in this space, and we actually looked at that from. Um, from a lot of different focal points. You know, there are some communities that are much further along in this work than the town of Fairfield is. So we looked at what they were doing, but then we also looked at communities that hadn't even started this work yet. So again, yeah, looking at best practices all around. And then finally, and, and one of the um, kind of most important things that we'll talk about is we reviewed the CCM racial equity toolkit. Um, and we we started to realize there's actually a great blueprint um, kind of template, if you will, for cities like ours. Um, CCM, for those of you who don't know, it's the Connecticut Conference of Mun Municipalities. Uh, again, reading from from notes here, it's the state's largest nonpartisan organization of munis municipal leaders representing towns and cities of all sizes from all corners of the state. They have 168 member 
members, different municipalities that are members of the CCM. So it's a great cross section of our state, again, representing all different sizes. Um, and, you know, the things that they do, not only are they interested in this work, but they collaborate with the Connecticut Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, for instance, the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. They are working very hard with the Connecticut Department of Public Health, all for kind of emergency management, emergency response. They have energy programming. So it's not just equity work, right? They look at purchasing to data management to demand response when it comes to energy. And we all know how important that is when we um, you know, lose power and have storms. They provide cities with information technology tools um, with IT professionals, but things like cybersecurity and data backup, disaster recovery, things that our IT guru, Dave Kelly, probably loves. Um, they offer executive search uh, consulting to help with hiring for uh, people to lead the different departments in town. And they have other tools that involve taxing or tax policy, budgeting, um, you know, CapEx, capital expenditure planning, financing, economic development. So things in this contract negotiations. Uh, and they also this year or the last year and a half started offering coronavirus resources, um, youth resources, sustainability resources. So they are a resource for a lot of different things. I'll deal with my dog in a minute. Um, so, so the yeah, reason why hear my dog. we we really looked to how are what is the best resources? What what is best practices? And we really felt like by going to CCM, whose main purpose is to outline best practices across all of those spaces, that they would would be a great resource for us to sort of anchor our work. We actually uh, talked to someone from CCM about how they did their work because they they're working with the National League of Cities who really work all across the country. So when we talk about kind of how we came to this work, it really was by trying to investigate what are best practices around the state and to, to help Fairfield to, to reach those same um, goals. Um, so that's sort of where we started and, and what we've been doing up until this point. Um, tonight, our goal is really to, um, is our last one, which is to have a community roundtable discussion. So the, the purpose of our discussion is really to, when we, when we look to CCM and we're going to, at the end of tonight, really go through some of the key areas that they outline that we should address. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were representing the citizens of Fairfield within the blueprint, that when we present to the board of selectmen, that they understand that these Ultimately, this work is about people, all of the people in this town, you know, making it fair feels a place that feels safe and comfortable for every single person who lives here. So what, what we're about to move into kind of on our agenda and, and Betsy, you'll see, I just kind of cued you to unmute. I'll invite you in just a moment to share something with us, but where uh, certainly also, if you have questions on what Jeanette and I shared, that's sort of the first the first line item or the you know on our agenda is like a little bit about us, a little bit of background about our background and the work that we've done to date. So if you have questions, you can fire them away in the chat. Um, but we want to move on to the next section, which is where really we're going to invite people in to share their stories first and foremost, um, and that would be stories that. Um, or, or of their personal experiences, stories of incidents of racism, and um, perhaps more than just individual uh, individual things, which we know happen, but also that are um, more along the lines of, or not more along the lines, but also along the lines of within the structures that we have in place, within the education space, within law enforcement, um, within some of those areas that we're really trying to look at in our town where we can maybe make some positive uh, positive movement and, and forward progress. So start to think about whether there's a, a story that you'd like to share with us. And um, what I'm going to ask is if you do have a story, go ahead and put in the chat, I have a story. Um, we'll start to manage that because we wanna be able to invite everybody to share their stories if they have one to share with the group. Um, we're also going to take comments after, but we want to make sure we start with the stories and then we go to comments. We want to make sure that people share their stories without um, people 
commenting about those in particular. We're going to just actively listen to people and um, hold our comments till after those stories have come forth. So if you have a comment, you can say, I have a comment. If you have a story, you can say, I have a story. Before we do that, so you all understand the sequence. Hopefully you all understand the sequence that I just shared. There's stories first, comments afterwards. Um, we want to make sure that we are giving people the safe space to share those stories. People take a, um, um, a, an act of bravery when they tell their truths to a large community, many of whom are strangers. So we wanna make sure that we set the stage for that and create an environment that is here to listen, is here to um, take in what they're sharing with us and allow them to do it without any what's the right word for that, without any kind of person trying to negate what their experience is. This is their experiences, and um, that's what we'd like to come forth here. Anything else to share before we invite Betsy in? Uh, no, I so. That's all right. Betsy, I, I tried to unmute you. Are you there? Can you hear me? We can hear you. you. Would you, okay. I, I have this poem shared. Would you kind of um, give some context to it and kick off this section for us? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I um, in, am engaged in a lot of these conversations or try to be as much as I can um, on my Hold own. Hold on one second, Betsy. You know what I, I believe I yeah. need to do? Could you state for the recording your name and, and your kind of oh. street and town uh, issue? Just, just, your name is fine. just your name is fine. Just make sure you state your name before you speak in these calls. Sure, sure. Sorry. This is no, um, okay. Betsy McNeil, um, resident of Fairfield. Um, in, in some of my uh, own personal journey work um, and, and conversations around race uh, and social justice, um, recently um, I, a wonderful facilitator um, in a session that I was in um, brought this particular poem to our attention and I, it, it moved me. Um, it, to me, it really played a big role in grounding me in the space um, and brought me together and brought the whole group together um, to do this work. Uh, so we wanted to share it with you today. I wanna to give credit to the facilitator was L. Roberts of KJR Consulting, um, who brought this to my attention. And this is a poem by Mickey Scott Bay Jones called Invitation to Brave Space. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space we exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds in this space. We seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility, the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. We'll put the slides up again in a little bit. Hopefully we're, we're back on video here, but um, in the spirit of sharing. Uh, so, I think, you know, when we talk about our experiences with race in the world and in Fairfield in particular, I think, you know, we, we think about, I think some of us think about race as individual acts of meanness, you know, one person doing something mean to another. And by all means, those are incidents of, that feel very disturbing and unsettling and, and make people feel unsafe where they are. What we can do as a task force is really think more deeply about when these things happen, is there a way that they're supported by existing structures? So, you know, when, when something happens, we can look at it as one incident, but we can also pull back the camera a little bit and say, wh where could we impact this, this incident and make a change? So our goal tonight is to really think about things from that perspective. Where are the things that we as a task force can intervene? Because unfortunately, we can't change people's um, people's ideas in 
we can't legislate people's ideas. That's not what happens in this country. But we can say that we don't have to support them with our existing structures in town. That that as a community, we can help the board of selectmen recognize where we can intervene. So I want to start off by giving you an example of, of exactly what we're talking about. I received about a month and a half ago, I received an email from a, a local person and uh, they, they sent this to me. So I'm just gonna read it to you. This is actually a copy of an incident report that they submitted to the police station. At approximately 5.30 on 4.26.2021, I was detained by two Fairfield police officers while traveling on High Street. When both officers approached my vehicle, they began to ask me a series of questions. During their questioning, they did not attempt to ask me or identify or, or identify myself or ask for my vehicle registration. After I stopped answering their repeated questions regarding my whereabouts for the day, they informed me that they were in search of a black male driving a blue car, who they said had entered someone else's house. As you can see from the image of my car and registration, my car is not blue, it's gray. After a few more questions, which seemed to convince the officers I was not the black male they were seeking, they told me I could leave. This incident is disturbing for several reasons. Being racially profiled by my local police force is extremely unsettling. Given I was traveling with my eight-year-old son, I am quite disappointed in the complete lack of professionalism exhibited by these officers. It would be interesting to know how unjust actions like these can be present, uh, prevented in the future. So, at the, the family went in and, and, and uh, made this report. As a result, the, um, the chief and, uh, so Chief Calamaris and uh, Lieutenant Felix Esposito actually investigated the incident. They pulled out all of the, um, all of the data. They pulled out the, the, the 911 calls, call, yeah. the dispatch calls, the police videos, and they set up a presentation and they invited the family to come in and to, to review it. Upon reviewing it, you know, they, they recognize that there were, uh, that the, the officers did not actually listen to the dispatch. The dispatch. The dispatch call actually said they were looking for a white male wearing a black hoodie, driving a blue car. So um, they then, the chief invited the task force to come in to review the same material. So we came in, actually Karen and I and Bev, who's another one of our task force members, went in and, and Chief Calamaris and Lieutenant Esposito actually went through the entire presentation with us. So I think, you know, step one that I think is really interesting when I'm when we're talking about what we can do as a task force, they recognize that there was a problem and they reached out to us for advice to say, help us look at this and say, you know, are we is there something else that we can do here? So we sat down, we went through it. We had, I thought, a very good conversation. It was extremely, um, they were ext I, you know, extremely transparent about it. Um, they, they brought us through it step by step. And um, when, when we had the realization of what was going on, they were, they were nodding with us. They were saying, yes, this happened. Full acknowledgement that implicit bias played a role in what happened, that the officers heard the word black in the context of black hoodie and pulled over a black male. So, and two officers did the same thing. Um, we all discussed the fact that while it was a mistake, it was a mistake that was made because of an implicit bias. And that has to be not just identified, but then used perhaps as an example for training. Um, they shared with us that the officers went to uh, the family's house and, um, uh, you know, and, and had a long conversation with them. The chief, they, they, they really, they uh, worked to um, kind of make some, uh, make some ground with the family to make sure the family was comfortable and the family felt comfortable um, with uh, talking to us about it. And then they were very, again, comfortable working with us about it. Um, so not only did the incident, it wasn't handled in a way that was defensive. It was handled in a way that was productive and constructive and in collaboration, which led to the next step. So then um, as a result of that meeting, they then uh, sent an email to us inviting us to the last, the most current round of interviews. They really wanted to kind of take a look at their interview procedure to say, to see if there was any way that we could 
work with them on the process. So generally the, the process is for officers and two civilians. They invited us to, to be one of the civilians on, on the, um, on on the, the panel that on the panel. interviews new police hires, new right. candidates. And so we were able to participate in that. And again, through that day, we, we were able to really talk about the composition of the st of the, the police force and how you can really look at, you know, what, what can be done with the process to, to make sure that you can actually get a wider array of officers who are more representative of the full community. And, and um, really, there was a lot of conversation during the day and we really kind of talked about the work that we do, the work that they do. And we worked in, we, there was a very in great family. collaboration. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, I, I, I got off the phone with Lieutenant Esposito earlier today. He also has invited us to work with him on, on developing the um, to further development of the interview procedure because we, we talked a little bit about where there could be biases in the in the procedure. So again, it was really about this this incident then led to not only discussing the incident with us, looking having them look again at, at their hiring practices. And in addition, another thing that happened that which I just happened today was they're bringing in a woman called Amy Herman who uh, taught, who does a presentation on the, the art of perception that she's done with the N, uh, NYPD and she's gonna be presenting in September. So when we look at this, this incident, this was an incident that was really hurtful to people in town, but the hope is it has opened up the door so that it doesn't have to happen again. That's, that in, in, in its core is what the work of this task force is. So with your stories, we're hoping to really be able to drill down into the same thing. Hopefully maybe we can identify you know, who we need to contact, how we can work together, how we can expand the work that we do so that these things that have happened to you don't continue to happen. So um, with that, I think we'd like to, to start hearing yeah. some of your stories. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for um, for listening to all of that because for us it's a bit of a beacon of hope, um, and we're just so grateful to um, to the chief and Lieutenant Esposito. So again, we want to do that for you too. So uh, the first person who would like to share a story um, is Jennifer um, Bar Barahona. Barahona. Um, we have to click on you, Jennifer, to unmute you. So just give us a moment here. For you, boy, we have so many Jennifers. I'm going to, I sent you a request to unmute Jennifer. Did you get that? Did that come through to you? I did, thank you. Can you hear oh, me? Great. Yeah, and after Jennifer would be Sunila. Well, I'm surprised I was, uh, I was first, but thanks. I don't have a well, you know, kind of formed story. I just want to say I've been a McKinley parent for eight years and, um, Anyone who knows Fairfield knows that's saying a lot in and of itself that there has just been historical um, perception of McKinley as less than, and it's shrouded in, um, you know, I think there's this, well, my daughter who's now at Tomlinson will say, people tell her, oh, you're from the poor school. Um, and so they equate um, diversity of our school with being poor and that is perpetuated. And she heard it as soon as she started commingling with peers at, you know, a summer camp, park and rec and others. Um, I had when we, in fact, the, the gentleman who wrote in about being pulled over on High Street, we were looking at a home on High Street and my realtor called to say to the other realtor, we wanna come and look at a house over near, it was near uh, Fairfield Woods Library. And the realtor said, well, if they're looking on High Street, I'm sure the house I'm showing is out of their price range. Um, and then the third one was uh, a colleague of mine at the time when I said, we're moving to Fairfield. And my husband, and I grew up in Fairfield County. My husband is a Latino and we chose Fairfield and really specifically this area because we felt it was a little pocket of diversity that we wanted. Um, and she said, is it, that's the McKinley district. Is it too late to close on your house? Um, you can't send your kids to that school. And I, you know, eight years in, my son will be a fifth grader next year and I'll have, have nine years under my belt at McKinley, but I see it, we saw it this year, again, with the gr racist graffiti that um, I was so glad to meet John Whaley that day and all the kids that descended upon McKinley to uh, spread the positive graffiti on uh, Martin Luther King weekend. But, um, you know, this is a long time reckoning that needs to happen in Fairfield in the way that we treat uh, the children coming out of that school. It's 
uh, abhorrent and um, appreciate you hearing me out tonight. And I see some other McKinley uh, moms on this call that I'm, I'm happy to see too. And uh, I will yield the floor and uh, mute myself before my dog starts. Thank you for me. <laughs> Dogs, solidarity. Thank you so much for sharing, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Sunila is next. Sunila, let me go to you. <laughs> oh, the tech. Oh, the tech. Where is it? All right. I'm requesting that you unmute now. The recruit request was sent. Did you get it? Yes, I got it. Um, hi, for my name is Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Sunila Fadel. Um, I just moved to Fairfield um, last May. Um, and we just started sending our kids to I have twin boys in first grade at Burr. Um, they just graduated, but um, we just started re from remote to in school back in April. So it's all been very, you know, adjusting to be back in school and, you know, just being social again and around people and in a new town. So it's already been sort of a tough adjustment. Um, but we had an incident where Again, you know, I know that they've been taught, um, you know, uh, in Black History Month, and there was a video that was played around uh, Martin Luther King Day um, to sort of teach about that. And it's a tough concept, I understand, for first graders. Um, and so with that in mind, like, you know, with this incident where um, they were on the bus and a classmate um, who was white said to my kids who were dark brown that um you're my slaves and my my son got off the bus and was like you know so and so said something and it made me very sad and upset and i was like okay let's go home and we'll talk about it and he's like well you know this person said that i'm their slave i'm like well what do you mean uh, i didn't really understand um and he said well she said that martin luther king said that white people had brown people as slaves so were her slaves um and he just started crying and he was upset. And it was a really hard thing to, I didn't think I'd have to have this conversation with them at seven. Um, but what I'm realizing is we need to help these teachers be better equipped to teach this material, to handle the questions, to get the message across. Um, you know, and, and additionally, like have teachers that represent different students of different backgrounds um so that we can get this message across that's more inclusive and you know obviously it for that to be said it, it obviously the message doesn't get through the way it was intended and that means that the support wasn't there to get teachers the training to teach because this is happening much earlier i mean i grew up in the u.s and um i don't remember hearing that at seven um did I hear things later on in life? Sure. And that's what I was prepared to do with my own kids, but I didn't expect that to happen at such a young age. So it's definitely something that I think we need to help support the community and, and schools. Thank you so much for your story. Um, next, we're gonna have Jennifer Elwood. Let me unmute her. Is here? You got it? Okay, thank you. Request sent, Jennifer. Hey, does that work? It mm -hmm. did, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Elwood, and I am a resident of Fairfield. Um, I'm going to uh, mention a couple of things. Um, one in relation to what um, Jennifer Barahona just shared. Um, over the weekend, I was at a graduation party. Um, for some fifth grade kiddos and there was there were older siblings there as well. And I had a long talk with a rising eighth grader at Tomlinson who was from McKinley um, and she shared that she was experiencing the same thing. Um, kids at Tomlinson um, excluding her and other McKinley kids um, saying you're from McKinley, that's the poor school, you know, you kind of do your own thing. Mm. And then one step further, um, without revealing too many details, um, kids in her school were also making fun of her mother um, based on 
her grammar. Um, English is not her first language. She speaks many languages. Um, but because her English grammar was not the way they thought it should be, they were making fun of her, um, equating ignorance um, or um, I'm not sure what with the way that she spoke. Um, other students uh, who are now in high school have also communicated the same thing to me about their experience um, having been from McKinley and being very looked down upon and separated um, as a result. Um, the story that I have to tell um, is my daughter's story, so I feel a little bit hesitant to talk about it, um, but I'm going to try and talk about it from a systemic context. Um, so this particular one happened in school. Um, my daughters are black. Um, last year, my oldest was in second grade and she is a very advanced reader. So um, in her classroom, while she had a reading group, she was not meeting with the teacher often. That group was given books on their own um, with a little bit of a, a preview and then we're kind of doing their own reading. Um, so the book she was given um, was a story, a, a grown woman reflecting back on her fourth grade year, how she had moved to a new school. She was a new student and she made a friend and she was thrilled to make this friend. She brought the friend home with her. Um, the woman telling the story is white. The new friend was black um, and her parents let the girl come over and play. But after she left at dinner, they sat her down and said, um, do you have any other friends? You need to find someone else that's the same as you. Uh, you're white and she's black. This isn't this friendship isn't going to happen. The book goes on. She talks about how um, they never played again at home, but they did communicate with each other at school. Um, a couple of other pages like that. Um, and at the end, they're at graduation and their parents are becoming friendly at that point in time. Um, so that's for a second grader. Um, my daughter was um, still seven at the time when she was given this book. And the group discussion that the teacher did um, was purely around things that make us different and how we should love each other for our differences. It did not talk about race. It did not talk about racism. Um, and it certainly had, there was nothing spoken about um, in terms of the context of the book. The last page of the book says, um, this was a small step, but you know things are getting better. Um, so, my daughter came home. Um, obviously, I'm white. She's black, uh, and she asked me if we were going to not let her be a part of the family someday because she's black and we're white. Um, so I reached out to her teacher, um, who replied and said, "I'm sorry that she's upset. This book is part of our curriculum. It was given to me by, you know, this is a this is a school resource." I replied again, and that was her response again. Um, I, I specifically mentioned, um, you know, we've talked about the fact that my daughter is black and we are white and race is a complex issue in our home. And, you know, we need to talk about this and and um, the teacher was not able to. She wasn't equipped to have that conversation. So I went to the principal um, and the book was removed from McKinley um, and, you know, the principal had a lot of, of conversations with me and um, we are actually working together in some other ways, which is fantastic. But um, the point is the teachers, even in McKinley, where there are many countries and many ethnicities represented, do not have the tools to talk from a, a factual and supportive perspective about race and racism with children. And it causes way more harm than actually talking about it. Um, and it is essential that our teachers are equipped to have these conversations because it's happening for our kids. And the more we gloss over it and pretend like it's not there, um, the more dangerous it is for our children. 
and um, yeah, I guess I guess that's it. Um, in in my opinion, we need inclusive materials in our classrooms that represent um, people and children of all ethnic ethnicities as the positive protagonist in the story. And we need uh, honest history at a developmentally appropriate level. And our teachers need to be able to talk uh, about race and racism in a way that makes our kids feel safe and seen and heard. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that was a really powerful story. Um, so I'd like to share my a personal story about my family. Um, I have two children who came through the Fairfield schools, um, a son and a daughter, who had very different experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, one was an in-school experience, one was another, um, where my son uh, was on the bus coming home from school. This is years ago. They both have grad since graduated. And um, a student attempted to set his hair on fire in the bus because my son had dreadlocks. And um, he'd been harassing him, you know, calling him names for a while. And so I called the school immediately as soon as he got home because he got off the bus, you know, completely stunned. And this was the pre previous administration. So it, it's not the, the current headmaster. And while the response was swift, um, at no point did anyone circle back to my child. It was sort of like, okay, this is handled. We handled the other student, everything's fine. And my, my son kind of had to go on with his life. And he's older now, and we actually had a conversation about it recently, about what he wishes he could have, hap could have happened. And, and he said, you know, I really wish that, that the adults in the environment recognize that like I'm a human being who has to share space on the earth with this other human being. And staying, we, I was looking for the adults to to make it right for me and make me understand and, and he said also like now as an older you know he's in his early 20s I recognize that 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 student he needed things too and they let they let us both down because in the the sort of haste to make it go away he felt like they didn't address that he was he was a human being left damaged um so that was one story. And then the other one is, is sort of a thing that happens all the time in terms of how people get profiled in town, which is that um, my daughter, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but the teenagers love to hang out at the beach in the evenings. I, I don't know if you people younger children know this, but uh, that's sort of a thing that the teenagers go down to the beach and get up to all sorts of shenanigans. <laughs> and um, on one occasion, you know, they're all just hanging out and, and they were the others were getting up to something and the police came and they ignored all this, the other kids who were doing things and they only walked up to my daughter. And she was the only person that, that they actually um, addressed. And, you know, she felt very targeted because she, she said, you know, I'm standing here with, you know, 15 other kids and not all of them were doing what they were supposed to be doing. I wasn't doing anything, but for some reason I was the only one that was seen. And so, you know, part of growing up at Fearful for her has been being very conspicuous in a number of ways. Um, and that that feels really difficult when you're trying to grow up as well. And so, you know, again, it was, was the, the officer, why was she the only one that, that was selected? In her mind, she said, I can't see any other reason. He walked around other, other people who clearly looked like they were up to something to get to me. And so I did feel like he was the person I was targeted. And again, it, and we, I did have this conversation with the, with the police chief, so I know that that's something that we've talked about. But again, it does cloud your experience in Fairfield. And, and my son and my daughter both said to me, they can't remember a day in high school where they did not either hear a racial slur or see a swastika every day for the entire time they were in high school in Fairfield. So, um, you know, we have work to do. Um, so thank you all. I don't know if there's anyone else that has a story to share. Yeah, if you have it, if you do have a story to share, um, type in the chat box or type that you have one in the chat box. 
You can also email um, the email that you use to RSVP to this if you wanted to public make a public comment. Um, you can also email any stories that you'd like to share um, uh, just with our task force. We um, will honor them and listen to each and every one of them if you would like to send them to us. Um, yeah, yeah, every day. Every day. Yeah. There was another incident too where uh, one of my daughter's friend, uh, a young man who's Jewish, uh, they were walking down the street with me one day and her, her friend said, you know, there's this boy who's been bothering me. And, and uh, he sent me a picture that, that this other student had been sending him. And it was a picture of him that he'd taken a class, very similar to what happened just recently um, with the swastika drawn on it and, um, you know, a, a racial slur under it. And, and I forwarded it right to the, the principal who again addressed it, but not in the same way that a recent incident was addressed. It was sort of addressed quietly and pushed a, a aside. And I think that's what students were very upset. Okay, thank you. Yes, I see. Um, thank you, Molly. Uh, I, I'm going to have, um, oh, a hand is raised. Okay, thank you. I don't know who got there first, Amy or Reverend Lord. Um, Why don't we have so Amy go first and then we'll, we'll have uh, Reverend, Reverend Lord. Just... Yeah, so Amy, I'm going to unmute you. I just sent that request. Hopefully, did you get that? You're yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I have I have a few stories, but I think I'm going to save stories to email you, uh, Equity Task Force. Um, you know, especially those stories of my children. But um, I do want to just share uh, with regard to um, anti-Semitism. Yeah, I've been a Fair, Fairfield resident. I'm Amy Guerrero, by the way, and I've been a Fairfield resident for almost 20 years. We moved from Stanford um, in August 2001, and as I shared at the George Floyd vigil, um, my husband and I felt like we had made a mistake um, moving here. Um, but that's a story for another day. Fast forward to 2009 there were three masked teens um, standing across the street from the Sherman gazebo, and they were holding two flags. One was of a swastika, and the other one was the Iron Cross, which um, is typically uh, associated with Nazi forces. And this was in December of 2009, and uh, I believe it was the first night of the um, the town menorah lighting, and at that time it was at the Sherman gazebo. And, um, you know, their, their purpose was to terrorize. Um, and um, at that time, I think there were maybe 25 people at the menorah lighting. One of them was at that time that was the first selectman, Ken Flato, who is Jewish. Um, but um, they were undaunted. The police came and um, I believe they only caught one of the masked people. But what I want to share is what happened after that. And it, there was an ecumenical gathering of the Fairfield community um, at a synagogue. And um, my whole family went and um, our kids were really little then. And, um, and it was just great. Uh, uh, Senator Blumenthal was the attorney general and he was there and um, elected officials and lots of different clergy. And I share this because it was a moment in Fairfield where the community came together. And, um, and I wish that there were more situations where we could come together. After that, my, um, my neighbor came out and saw me. I was, um, I was pushing my youngest in the stroller she, he, and he's Jewish and he came out crying. He said, Amy, I saw you there with your little family. It meant so much that you were there. And I thought to myself, why weren't, I mean, why is that a surprise? Shouldn't we all be there when, when one group of us is attacked or terrorized? I, I, I'm very um, disappointed that that doesn't happen. And, and that was 2009. And there have been more incidences of anti-Semitism here in Fairfield. And um, like I have shared before, it, it is a, it is, it's something that has not, in my opinion, been adequately addressed uh, as well as a lot of 
situations. Um, you know, so, so, um, so I just share that. Um, and I have just my own, just real quick is last April, I was in Trader Joe's and um, I have seasonal allergies. So I would sneeze and cough. And let me tell you, I just, that the glares, the, and um, that I experienced sh going food shopping uh, during the, tam the pandemic were just over overwhelming. And I, I kept that in though. I didn't really share that um, much. And um, so when my husband said, um, I'll do the shopping, I said, okay, yeah, go for it, <laughs> you know? But it's something that I, I just didn't uh, verbalize much, but it's, it's, uh, it's something that did happen to me. Um, uh, and like I said, I, there are more, but I just, I will uh, save my other stories for another time. I appreciate this opportunity to share. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, our, our email is always opened. So um, I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Reverend Lord wants to share, wants to, to, um, to participate. Uh, Reverend Lord, do you want to share a story or make a comment? Because we, we wanted to have all the people tell their stories first before we went to comments. He's muted. Um, so let me unmute him real quick and we can just confirm. He's under D. Under D? Yeah. D. Up to D. Oops. D Stanley Lord, got you. Okay. I just asked him to un or requested he unmute. There he is. Were you, were you going to share a story or make a comment? No, we'll, we'll wait until the end. Okay, great. All right, no, thank no, you. No story. Okay, All right, great. great. We'll we'll thank get you. we'll get you, you the first comment. Yeah, first comment. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, um, so next we have. That's um, where to go. Uh, next we had um, Betsy Betsy McNeil. Um, would like to share. Betsy, I'm unmuting you now. You get that? Can you hear me? We yes. can, yes. And then after that, Yasmin. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just briefly, oh, I'm Betsy McNeil. Um, no, no, no. Uh, my family moved uh, to Fairfield uh, most recently from Northern California about six years ago now. Um, at the time, our children were 10 and 5 and now 16 and 11. Um, we are a biracial family, so I'll be honest, the single biggest thing I was worried about in moving out here was the lack of diversity and what that would mean. Um, we came from an area where it was normal to see and engage with multiracial families, we fit in completely and we felt safe moving through most of the spaces that we entered. Um, I was really worried about the loss of that environment and what that would mean um, stepping into a predominantly white Fairfield town. Um, at first, I'll be honest, I was pleasantly surprised how the community for the most part welcomed us with open arms. Um, it was a good lesson for me to check my own biases um, for myself. Um, and we have really met truly wonderful people who genuinely love and care for our family. Um, but uh, my husband and I are more than keenly aware that uh, Fairfield is no different than so many other spaces and places we move through. Um, many well-intentioned people um, who are simply unaware of the systemic racism that shows up everywhere. Um, my husband and I are, uh, we're pretty, uh, we, we lay low. <laughs> we're uh, inherently introverts. Um, uh, we keep to ourselves, um, but definitely when it comes to issues of race, when we are in predominantly white spaces, um, I have learned um, from being with my husband for over 25 years to keep my thoughts and feelings about race and racism wrapped up and to ourselves within our family. Um, we talk about it all the time here, but, um, you brush things off that you hear and you feel and you see, you keep your head down, you don't bring more attention to, um, to us than we already do as a biracial couple. Um, but now I'm watching my teenage son um, navigate this town as a biracial youngster. And uh, as I continue to do my own work as well, 
um, to understand um, and get better. I'm finding it much harder to ignore what I'm seeing, hearing, and experiencing um, from my own family, um, but possibly even more so from all of you um, and others in this town. Um, to be honest, our family is pretty fortunate um, that so far we haven't really experienced any overt um, or blatantly racist acts. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but the comments and words that are used on a regular basis all around us are, are enough. Um, similar to Amy, I don't feel comfortable sharing specifics from um, my son's experiences, um, but some general anecdotes are very similar to some of what we've been hearing. The N-word is used regularly amongst the teenagers um, and is a regular occurrence around my son, um, along with other um, racially motivated um, and clearly biased comments and conversations. Teachers make comments that reveal their unchecked bias pretty clearly um, and are very clearly ill-equipped um, uh, or supported to engage students in discussion around race. Um, my husband's been questioned by police about whether he actually lives in this town. Um, and, you know, what's hard too is that um, many comments from friends and acquaintances alike um, that are unintentional microaggressions. Um, so there's, I know there's clearly many examples of overt, you know, acts and experiences of people. What I want to also convey um, is that aspects of racism show up in the air we breathe and really create cumulative emotional and physical harm. Um, so much of this work is hard because it's often about making what is invisible to so many actually visible. Um, but my hope, um, and I certainly believe, certainly because at least all of you on this call who are taking the time to come together um, and to all of you on the, on the task force, to come together and listen and share. Um, we have a lot of work to do to, as a town, but um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can, we can make it happen and create change. So thank you all for, for being here and for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna get to Yasmin next. Um, yeah, I, while I'm looking for Yasmin, because I have to go to why, so I want to say thank you all for your bravery and sharing. Yasmin, I am requesting the unme unmute. I just requested that you, un yep, you're unmuted, I believe. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for making this happen. I do think it's important. I hesitated about whether I should share it tonight, but I will do that. Um, I'm a lifelong Fairfield resident. I was born and raised here, actually. Went through the Fairfield public school system. I'm a daughter of immigrants. And I'm married to a black man. And I think that um, I'll just point out a couple of stories that would probably show biases or um, systemic racism without getting into too much detail. But um, my husband, who is also an immigrant and from Sudan, is will rarely go to any of the town um, municipal buildings by himself because he feels that people don't treat him with respect. They don't know what he is here for. Um, there, he has an accent. Uh, sometimes he struggles trying to understand what he's doing. That you know, often I have to accompany him so he has the backup support to get what he needs. Um, in fact, once he went on his own to get our marriage certificate from the town, and they literally tried to convince him for five minutes that his marriage certificate wouldn't be there because I guess in their minds, he could not have been married in the town um, of Fairfield. So I then was watching my two children and actually my brother's two children. I walked to the town of Fairfield, went to the same office, spoke to the same woman, did not tell her who I was, requested the same information. I was treated with respect, kindness. She gave it to me right away. And then I went to her superior immediately, cried in her office, explained why I was there and how uh, devastated my husband was about that experience. Um, I feel that, um, you know, unless you walk in these shoes or you walk side by side, it's hard to believe, but um, I'm also Muslim. So my father was Muslim, my mother was Christian. I was raised in this town 
always proud of my Middle Eastern culture, spoke two languages, um, multi-religious, uh, you know, a child of an immigrant. I mean, we lived the American dream and certainly my husband is also now living the American dream. But to tell, I'll tell you that I would say there are a small handful of people that just know now that my daughter is Muslim. It is not something she shares openly and widely like I did with pride. Um, and I think that, um, I, I don't think I met one of, uh, I met a teacher along the way and I won't say who he is or what school he's in who also um, is a Muslim. You might not know it from his name or how he looks. Um, I'll just say that and says he doesn't share it with anyone either. It's extremely disappointing um, to think that way back when, when I grew up, I, it's almost like it was, it was just a different time in a different world. Um, I will also say that the teachers in the schools, even though sometimes their hearts are in the right places, they are certainly not equipped with um, handling children who are dealing with issues and making complaints. My daughter made um, a serious complaint this year at the public high school. Uh, she had to make the complaint two to three times. And um, when I finally went and spoke to the head principal, I said to him, you know, the principal she spoke to never once came back to her and said, how are you doing? Never circled back around to her. For a young woman to make a serious complaint of racism against a teacher and you're sending her back into that classroom for the remainder of the year, for that person not to follow up with her, not to say, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Even though she actually tried to handle it on her own after the first complaint, you would expect of that serious nature, someone would pull her aside and say, how's it going now? What are you doing? How are you feeling? Have things changed? Have, is it better? Is it worse? Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, and, and to tell you the truth, I continuously had to follow up, even though I went to the top, to the top, right? It, it was like, they also, I finally had to send a follow-up email there too, as well as like, where are we with this situation? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was, I was busy with the prom last week. You were busy with the prom? Like, and I know the intentions were good. I, I sat face to face with the gentlemen. I know they mean well, but it is sad to think that, um, yeah, that we're, we're, that we're in this place. And, you know, I, I do have several other stories to share, but I know we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. I, I think that those are kind of the, the bigger picture issues that I see from where I'm going through. Um, yeah. And, I will say, though, my situation with my elementary school son just a few months ago, um, I was pleasantly surprised when the, the principal did call to follow up and ask me how he handled the situation. I was um, taken aback by that because it hadn't been my experience so far, but he did follow up and I thanked him for that and we gave him our honest feedback on how he handled the situation and he continued to follow up with us throughout the year. But that was the only instance. Um, but, you know, again, going back to my daughter, she's a young 16 year old woman, uh, you know, standing up for herself, not getting her parents involved. And I, I think there's a lot of major issues. And she also notes the language that's used in the hallways and the classrooms. You know, whether it's like in pop culture manner or not, it's definitely uh, yeah, not appropriate. But. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, you know, again, I, if there's a story that you'd like to tell that you, you know, want to keep personal and, and you want us to be personalized, you can do that. Just like the story that I read initially, you know, particularly uh, the story that's really standing out to me is your experience with municipal services, because that's what we're talking about. That's the kind of thing that we can intervene with and that, and having stories like that will really help us to explain why the need is because again if we're if we're saying that we're a community that is open and welcoming and people want to think of us as a community that's welcoming i hear your story and i feel hurt by that because that that's that is not the promise of what we are saying that we are like mm -hmm. the joy of getting your marriage certificate i mean i, I promise us i wouldn't comment but i just you say mm -hmm. like the joy of getting your marriage certificate should not wind up with both of you feeling badly about yourself because someone couldn't see you for who you are. And that is something that, that you know, systemically we can look at. 
as well and um, yeah. make some recommendations for it and, and really, you know, alert people who don't understand what that is, what that does to you and, and how you go forward. And, and particularly, I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the stories about what's going on with the school, I think we are definitely gonna make, um, we're gonna incorporate into the blueprint in many different ways. Yeah. So um, you can contact us. We, I probably will follow up with all of you too, just to yeah. see if there's anything else that you'd like to add and make sure we have the stories okay. correct as well. But I, but I really thank you all for sharing yeah. um, because it, it has been, it's been enlightening, but it also, um, I, I feel that um, this is why we volunteer and we do this. And, I, and I, we don't have much to offer you, except that you, we're gonna advocate. That's, yeah. that's really all we can do is advocate all of your positions. So yeah. thank you for sharing. Um, so we don't have any more stories. We're going to move to comments. So Reverend Lord and then Amy and then John in sequence of comments and it's 8.45. So a time check, Reverend Lord, I'm um, unmuting you now or, or requesting that you can unmute yourself, I think. Um, so we'll take your comment first and then Amy will do yours and then John will do yours. And um, we do wanna save time for our last agenda items. So um, I'll be watching the clock just so you all know, but um, I think we, if we just covered yes. this slide. We'll follow up with the, yeah. Okay. All right, Reverend Lord. Good evening all. Good evening. Thank you for your courage this evening for those who have spoken and told their stories. It's heart-wrenching to hear these stories. The Greater Bridgeport NACP is behind you and with you. The Greater Bridgeport NACP has also offered to train your administration within your school systems on diversity, sensitivity training, the superintendent has accepted our proposals. You have teachers within your system that really shouldn't be there. We had a student who had graduated four years ago. She just graduated college and was telling us a story and she broke down and cried. We're talking about six years later because of something a teacher said to her about her culture. That type of behavior within and a is intolerable. It is our job as in its NACP to help teach, rule out, weed out those who maybe this is not a profession for them. And we will help facilitate that process. And we will name names when it comes time that certain teachers in your school district do not belong teaching students because of their own personal bias. We all have them. But sometimes you, they need to realize them and if they're not going to be in line with what is good for our students, then they need to seek a different profession. So we're here to help. We're here to listen. I, I, I just, I've just found out tonight that at our general body meeting that, which everybody's invited to every fourth Thursday night, <laughs> We have our general body meeting of the Greater Bridgeport NACP. Follow us on Facebook, get the link. You don't have to be a member to come to our meetings, but you should become a member. <laughs> you should come in support of what the work that we're doing, because we're speaking out, we're being noticed. We do a lot of pressers as you, as you have seen, uh, and we're here to really support everybody. And uh, if we can be of service to you, and we'll be in touch with email uh, with you as well. And I really want to be a 
facilitator, a resource to help, especially those who are going through. We're also going to be meeting with the students. When I say meeting with the students, it will not be the adults. It will be college students because students listen to students. They don't want to listen to any of our old, old heads. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want to listen to the parents. So what we do, we have college chapters that will come in and talk to the students and deal with the issue of race and how to talk about race with the students and how to deal with such as if the issue happens, how to report it, how to uh, react and do not keep it within. Keeping it within tears you apart and do not let them have that kind of power because power is only given. You give somebody the power and we're not about doing that. So we're, we're here to help the school district. We're here to help you. And the state has also, with NACP has also agreed to come in and do that training with your teachers and your administrators for all of your schools. We for, first thought it was just the high schools, but no. <laughs> we're yeah. starting at elementary, yeah. okay? Yeah. Because this is where it really begins to fester and the incident that happened at the uh, ward, ward in Ludlow, that happened at home. That started at home. And uh, there are other things that happened there that most of you don't know about, and I'm not gonna disclose right now, but that was deeply rooted for something that was going on at home. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we're here to, to help if you need to contact me, I will put my uh, email in the chat and you can reach out to me uh, anytime and with our office number. So please feel free to reach out. And uh, when you have your meetings, I'll, I'll join the list. Either I'll be on or one of my officers will definitely be gladly to be on the conversation and be part of the conversation. Because we're here, we can't do this unless we do this together. Absolutely. And, Thank and, you. And, we'll and definitely. What's Send rewarding is that you have a space to talk. Yeah. That's where it starts to yep. have the difficult conversation on race. Yeah. Thank so you. We, so we, we may have a town hall eventually in each city that's only going to deal with race. So have our town. Let's have let's have a difficult conversation. Uh, there was a if you ever get a chance to look at it, uh, uh, it's on our Facebook page. A difficult conversation with a black man with a police officer. Difficult conversation with a black man with a biracial couple. There, there are videos on our Facebook page and they're very, very interesting and very informative. That's great. So if you share your email in the chat. Yes. Um, and if you also, I don't know if you have a link handy to your Facebook page, you can share that in the chat as well. Yes. But thank you so much for, for sharing, for for commenting and for being here with us tonight. Yes. And we'll definitely send out um, a link to our meetings as well. So we hope Thank to you. see you again soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Stay, awesome. stay safe, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Connecticut, I mean, Bridgeport is only 39% vaccinated. I'm not sure about the other cities. So please, everybody, yeah. just because <laughs> the state has opened up doesn't mean it's time to let go. Of the <laughs> Thank okay. you. Gina and I, just so everyone knows, we are both fully vaccinated, which is why we are in yeah. close proximity to Yeah, yeah, I you understand. Don't, don't we don't need to worry about the two of us. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. Make sure so everybody next stays gonna... safe. Thank you. Thank next you. Next we're going to make a okay. comment. Yes. All right. I'll try to be brief. Um, Reverend Lord, if you're still here. Oh, I hope you. Oh, oh, great. Thank you so much. I, I definitely want to reach out to you, Reverend Lord. Um, I've, I've been angry for a long time and uh, I know it eats up at me and uh, just keeping it in, it, you know, is not a good thing. Um, so I just, um, you know, for anybody who didn't, hasn't um, known about this, I co-organized a rally, a Stop Asian Hate rally at the beginning of April. 
And um, I highlighted youth, young people, high schoolers, current high schoolers, and those who have graduated from Fairfield Public Schools, and they shared their stories of, of pain, indivis uh, sorry, invisibility, and uh, feeling like they're not treated by, uh, like Americans as growing up Asian American in Fairfield. Um, so hearing from the youth is so important. I was humbled to be invited to a high school virtual Stop Asian Hate rally. Um, and there was a Fairfield Public Schools um, history teacher who shared the importance of teaching the history of marginalized people, not only the shameful victimization, but also, and more importantly, their contributions to, to the growth of this country, the importance of teaching about agency um, of people of color. It's so important and in, in, in our library books, stories like what Jennifer's, uh, that heart-wrenching story that Jennifer Elwood talk, talked about uh, that her child had to listen to. Oh, that breaks my heart. So important that we take a look at what current picture books are, are part of the curriculum. I'm a school librarian, so I'd love to be part of that. Um, but we really need to take a look at um, at the curriculum all across the board. Um, and the last thing that I wanna say too, is that there needs to be the history of cross racial solidarity um, in the United States. That history has been kept from us and it has caused us to be pitted against each other. This model minority myth hurts the solidarity that Asian Americans could have with, especially with the black community. Um, and I want there to be this, you know, that that just has to end, end, end. So, um, so I look forward to positive change. I look forward to being part of positive change here in Fairfield. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I think um, you, you just brought up something. I think I, I received feedback recently that People assume that just because I happen to be the co-chair of this task force, that we only look at issues of black people, which is just not the truth. The truth is there are other people representing other ethnicities on this task force. We have Sikh people on this task force. We have people of different faiths. We have, you know, we, when we're talking about racial equity, we're talking about all of us. When I hear stories of Asian people and Muslim people and Jewish people and people who who don't who feel marginalized in this town. This task force is about all of our stories because if it is not fair for one of us, it is not fair for any of us. Um, John Whaley, sorry, I, I had to just it was not my turn to comment, yeah. but <laughs> Gina, it's always your turn to comment. Like to. Um, co, -chair, co chair privileges. They, uh, <laughs> I just want to say that, like, I only came, I'm not a Fairfield resident, everybody. So, like, I don't know what kind of privileges I have in this conversation, but I do. Well, John, you know what, John, can you introduce yourself? Because I don't know that we, you know, yeah. we're called, we're very being very familiar because we know you, but the world. The and tell people who you are. Yeah. So my name is John Whaley. Uh, I'm actually a Bridgeport resident, but I teach at Fairfield Ward High School and I'm a teacher advisor of the Fairfield Ward Voices for Equity. Um, and I've had my you know, hands in several different pots in regards to a lot of these issues over the past couple of years. And I did not expect the theme of tonight to be about education. I I, I did not, I, I came in this as sort of an, uh, you know, I just wanted to observe what was go going to happen here. And almost every story that somebody told centered uh, around our, what our kids, um, for some of them have to endure um, and at the very least experience in our, you know, in our public schools. So I, I'm, I wanted to add kind of my two cents uh, to help remind us that, you know, you guys are a governmental, you know, task force, but it's clear that one of the most urgent places that we need to be doing this hard and good work is within our public schools, which means within our board of education members. Yeah. Um, and which means also within all the parents on this call, be as active as it possibly can be 
um, not just voicing the the disparate times that you know these over acts happen, but to be sort of proactive about what it is that we want and what it is that we need for all of our children um, in our public schools. Um, you know, if you guys have read or heard about what Heather McGee's been talking about with the some of us, the idea that like racism doesn't just hurt people of color, like like this actually is hurting the vast majority of our white students as well. So um, I just want to make sure that, like, as we are kind of wrapping up here, the the, the theme that I, that's running through all of this is that what our children are being taught, how they are being taught, what we are deciding to pay for, um, how we are segregating students, how we are ranking and sorting students, all of the stuff of school seems to be like the the the, the front lines of all of all of this. So with all that we are hearing now, especially in the media in regards to this crazy nonsensical, you know, backlash to critical race theory and all of that kind of stuff, it's going to be extremely important for everybody on this call to make sure that you are going to be on the other side and saying like, listen, this is what we want in Fairfield. We want an equitable, a just, um, a, a celebratory and inclusive environment for our students um, as opposed to letting just the backlash to all of this kind of media sensationalized stuff uh, happen. Um, we are there, there are only a few teachers on this call, but the teachers that are on this call, I know are gung ho and ready you know, to work for this stuff. Um, so try and rally some more of the parents and teachers in town to make sure that we're all, like hundreds more are on the next call version of this. So thank you all for all that you yeah. do. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, um, so I think the thing is, you know, with, with our task force, it's really interesting. You know, we really um, are looking at sort of municipal areas and, and the way our town is, is structured. The Board of Education is sort of separate from the Board of Selectmen, but I don't see how we can truly disconnect them. Um, I remember reading someplace that, you know, with 11 elementary schools, three middle schools and two high schools, a quarter of the people who live in this town are students. And so we can't just pretend that those that is not important. We also can't pretend that the reason why our houses have value is because of our schools. They are, they are in, inextricably tied to what we are here. And so we do have to think about this as part of what we need to look at. And so that's something that, you know, we're gonna have to, yeah, and it's 60% it's of our town budget. So I don't think it's as easy to separate as, as um, it has been. And I think it's something that we're, we're gonna have to really yeah. Think about in, in our incorporation of our. Um, to wrap up. I don't know what I so I know it, it is nine o'clock, um, yeah. but I do want to, you well, know, have to, yeah, we have to at least address it. Right? Yeah. Is, well, I was just going to share about the child in the back seat, which it was a remember in that. In this. Oh, yeah. So what? So one little thought, and then um, Gina and I have one more slide to, to share that kind of. Um, gives you a teaser for what the blueprint is going to be about basically i know we have i can't read that name is that carlisle i i don't know that we have um time for comments uh beyond where we are right now because we still have one more agenda item to kind of just look at um so if you're comfortable typing something in that would be great if not you can email us the comment that i was about to make was that um the police stop that gina shared with us earlier um, one little detail of that is that the, the gentleman who was who was stopped his child was in the back seat. So um, so um, that was you know going to have to be a moment that would start that young man's education into um, the kind of unjust reality that his father was experiencing in this town. Our children are touched with all of these sort of individual acts of racism by either witnessing them by walking down the street in front of McKinley or going into TJ Maxx when the graffiti occurred, the, the events of in the other schools of graffiti in the, in the restrooms or on the walls. Our children are seeing individual acts of racism. And so, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, one thing that we want to do before we leave tonight is share um, as I know, a lot of people probably can whoa, I didn't mean to start my video. Hold on. I wanted to share my screen. Um, uh, just give me one more moment. Video back on. My video is back on here. Um, I wanted to share 
one more slide with you all because I know a lot of you came here because you're curious about the blueprint. Um, so Gina, I don't know if you want to talk about this and kind of where, oh, we should share the other one. Yeah. yeah. Let me just share the other so, one. Yep. so essentially in order for us, where, where we, we've been working out of this checklist for racial equity, it was, it's sort of broken up into six separate buckets that we're looking at. So the first was our organizational commitment, our leadership and our governance. Yep. Our second is the racial equity policies and implementation practices here in, in, in our town, our service-based equity. So how, uh, how equal are the services that, that people are experiencing in this town, our workforce composition, which comes up a lot, mm -hmm. um, community collaboration, and budget and contracting pro uh, practices. So those are our, our main, we, we started with this municipal checklist for racial equity, and it had all these questions there, like, you know, have we adopted a proclamation or resolution or public statement committing to addressing racial equity? And so what we did as, as a task force is we divided these out and we, we sought out the answers to these questions. And so when the blueprint comes out, you'll actually see what we considered, what, um, you know, what is, was the current status, what the best practices are, and then we'll make a recommendation about that. So, um, you know, that is off the bat, I can tell you that a recommendation that we're going to, that we notice is that our town does not have a statement, that we don't have a, a collective um, proclamation about what, how we feel about race. And we feel like that's really important. Um, you know, do we have an internal structure whose goal is to address e issues of racial equity? And so our work has been to really identify these, these areas. Um, and I think what we can do is we can actually share this on our website. If you wanted to take a look at, or we can actually yeah. can we put a link to this in the we, chat. We can. Put we can actually, you know, we can actually chat. put a link to this in the chat, out. which I think is probably the better thing. To the to whole, share. not the one pager. Yeah, to so the whole, to so the whole thing, but we can show them yeah. where one pager is. Yeah. So we'll put a link to that in the chat, so you can take a look at it. Um, and if anyone on the call, so that we have these questions, and, and we're really looking at the rationale for some of these things. If you take a look at it, and and you find that there is something that you really feel like you have an opinion about how well the town has, um, you know, has addressed that particular uh, question, we really um, would welcome any comments that you have um, that you could share with us because we, we ultimately feel like, you know, the power in this is that we are a community that is responsible for all of us. And we wanna make sure that we're advocating for you in the best way that we possibly can. Um, so we are, it's 905, we're a little over. Um, and so, so that's our, our presentation, but we did have room for comments. So if people want to stay on the call and uh, make a comment, please feel free. I know that yeah. Carlisle, Carlisle Spivey, I know that you wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Um, cause we're sort of done with what we have to do, but I wanted to give, you know. Yeah. Well, and, be, and at some point we're going to need to make a motion to close to right. adjourn, which we're not quite there yet. Um, but um, I just shared in the chat, the link to the CCM racial equity toolkit. So you should be able to have that. Um, I think I stopped sharing content. So you should be able to have that. Uh, if you wanna take a look at it, that is what largely has informed what we're drafting and putting together. But Gina and I were also talking, we have a few questions that came at us via email earlier today even. So we thought, you know, maybe what we'll do is send out a- um, A Google form. A Google form. So there, there are some questions that came up from the people who worked on, on from our task force members um, who really did an, just an awesome job um, really investigating all these things. And they had a couple of questions that we wanted to ask um, people's opinions on whether or not they they felt we should incorporate them so we'll we'll be sending out um a google form to everyone who has participated in this and um you know it, we would love to have your feedback as there as well we'll leave space for you to comment yeah. on that too um yeah i'm just reading this comment right here to see oh, so uh, i'm it's gonna another, it's sort of another another story that john has yeah. added sunila has another comment yeah. um sunila um if you carla first yeah, we're going to take two more comments. Yep, we're going to take we two more comments and then okay. close. So, Carlisle? We just uh, unmuted or sent you a request to unmute Carlisle so that you okay. could share. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yay. Um, and listening to everyone, it reminded me that when this task force was formed, more times than not, I heard 
why are we doing this? There's no racism in Fairfield. And the more I hear the stories, the more I realize that people are not tuned into this. Um, I know my husband and I, we do not have children, so we're not having experiences in the schools. And when I hear these stories, it absolutely appalls me. And it makes me wonder, what are the ramifications, both for the students who wittingly or unwittingly cause these problems, and what are their parents' responses to this? Do they brush it off? I was reading something the other day about the graffiti that's been showing up, and too often I without saying, look what they're trying to get attention with, and where does that come from? So I think one of the things that is going to be the hardest to do is to convince people in Fairfield that, yes, indeedy, folks, we got it. It's here to stay. And it's going to take work individually and in groups to do something about it. For sure. I, I, I would agree. I say all the time, the reason why people should care is because you don't want your kid ending up in the patch. And, and really, like, I think if people, if you can't care because somebody else is getting hurt, you might want to consider that yeah. part about it. That, that we, what, we what have, does that we say about you? <laughs> right. We have a responsibility to every child in this town, the ones, that you know are both the offenders and the offended. We we are responsible for all of them. That is our that is our work as adults. We're responsible for everybody. We have when we have to make sure and that we're well, preventing this. Yeah. Exactly. We're responsible for everybody, each to everyone else in the town. And if if we're not convinced that we have a problem, how do we go about solving it? Right. For sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um Sunila. Sunila have one more. Okay. Where is she? Okay, unmuting you again or sending you a note to unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I was kind of like quickly glancing over the, uh, the the one pager and just kind of looking at some of the things that were said and what I've seen in our own schools. Um, I think one of the action items or one of the bullets that you had was about you know recruiting diverse. Um, people in, in in the system, and I think for me personally, just because I have a kindergartner going in in September, and now two first uh, second graders, um, what's being done, or you know, what kind of uh, things can we put in place to get teachers of color, so that not only are my kids seeing someone that looks like them, but other kids are seeing people in leadership positions from different backgrounds. To, cap, to sort of develop that respect and that that view that okay this is you know this is something I'm seeing in someone that I'm that's a mentor that I look up to also mm -hmm. yeah it means a lot for your students to see people and I think you know one in looking at hiring practices I think one of the things that came up in our work with the police is even when even when we have a system that looks fair from the outside mm -hmm. from the outset when we look at you know who falls to the bottom of you know, a numbers game and who doesn't, when you have the same sort of consistency, you have to look at that and say, what, what's, what is here? What is in our hiring practices that is preventing us from having a, a diverse pool? Because I know, you know, we hear all the time, well, the problem is we don't get qualified applicants. Um, and, you know, I applied for a job as a school psychologist in Fairfield and mm -hmm. didn't get a call back. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think I'm a qualified applicant. Somebody else thought I was a qualified applicant. They did hire me. So, you know, I think ultimately, um, you know, really looking at your hiring practices and figuring out how are your hiring practices actually fair? What, what are, where are biases coming in? Where are not coming biases? Making sure you're still getting the best, most qualified candidates, but making sure that your priority is that you, our students have needs too, and we're addressing all of mm -hmm. them. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and that is definitely something that we're going to be addressing. So I hope that we continue. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all so much for your participation tonight. I think yeah. you know Karen and I've been working talking about tonight for a while, and I think it, it has gone, uh, in my opinion, probably yeah. better than either of us had imagined. We really appreciate all of your time and energy that you've spent with us this evening. Yeah. We hope that this is not the last time we hear from you. We'll be emailing all of you 
um, in the next couple of days with uh, this Google form. And we invite you to come to our meetings. They are alternate Tuesdays and Thursdays. The schedule is up on the, the town website um, under the Racial Justice and Equity Task Force. I think our next meeting is Tuesday. I think we have a meeting on Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. do need, um, I am currently unmuting Doug and any because we do need a motion to and adjourn. Sandra. <laughs> and Sandra, I think she's the phone. Right there. there she is. Yeah. So, so would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? Am I allowed to say that? No, I, I do. <laughs> Who was that? Any call, any dingra. Uh, would anyone like to second that motion? I'll second it. Start. Thank you, Doug. So we are adjourned, but again, I, I want to thank you all so much for your time and participation and um, welcome you to come to any of our meetings and you can reach us, uh, Mike, uh, do you want to put our emails in the chat? I think everybody who's here has the email right. for the re RSVP because they all, um, the people that are listening online, everybody, everybody, it's on the agenda, the yeah. email that um, is my, my Gmail for task force business. Yeah. So um, can reach out anytime. I'll forward it to all the other task force members. Um, we're still collecting stories and you'll be, you will all be kind of on a list of um, recipients of this document that Gina and I are talking about where we can maybe just ask a few follow-up questions as we continue to draft the blueprint based on that CCM kind of toolkit. Right. And remember that we are at this point, our, our goal is to make this blueprint and, and uh, pass it forward to the board of selectmen to advocate for you. So please continue to stay in contact with us um, if there's anything that you feel like you need us to advocate with. So thank you so much. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Also, I need a Gina and Karen podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I've not been saying I want to do a podcast. It would just be about cats. I will. <laughs>